Welcome to the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. I'm John Barrett, a professor of law at St. John's University in New York City, and I'm pleased to be here with three former Nuremberg prosecutors who participated in the work with Justice Robert H. Jackson at Nuremberg, Germany, prosecuting the senior Nazi officials during 1945-1946 before the International Military Tribunal. Let's set the stage for your work at Nuremberg by meeting each of you, our guests, Whitney Harris, Bernard Meltzer, and Henry King. Each, uh, each was a lawyer uh, and practicing, but let's, let's get a little bit more specific. Whitney, where were you and what was your career before Nuremberg? Well, I had started practicing law in a small law firm in Los Angeles. I had practiced law for about five years. Uh, my senior law partner was uh, hard, very hard of hearing. On December 7th, I remember at about 10.30 o'clock in the morning, he called me on the phone. He said, Whitney, he said, uh, the Japs have just bombed Pearl Harbor. Wow, I said, well, thank you, Mr. Goodspeed, and uh, hung up the phone. I didn't believe this, but then I thought a little bit more about it, and I said, my goodness, suppose that happened, so I turned on the radio. No television in those days, you know. Right. Turned on the radio. Sure enough, the Japs had bombed Pearl Harbor. The next day, I was applied for the commission in the United States Navy. Lucky, luckily, got it. And so I served in the Navy throughout the war, uh, but toward the end of the war, uh, I was uh, uh, assigned by the Navy to OSS, which is the Office of Strategic Services. That was the forerunner of the CIA, you know, the spy organization. And uh, I was received uh, training there in all kinds of uh, uh, weaponry and uh, that type of thing, and I was very nervous about what assignment I'd get afterwards, but anyway, the OSS sent me to Europe to investigate war crimes on behalf of OSS. And I was in Nuremberg, uh, I was in uh, 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 London when Justice Jackson came over with his nuclear staff, and uh, I got acquainted with that, uh, those uh, individuals because I used to take documents to them occasionally when I found them that were very good and very incriminating. And uh, eventually, I was invited to join, uh, to join the staff and went down to Nuremberg in August 1945. Great. Bernie Meltzer, how about you? What were you doing before the road led you to Nuremberg? Well, after law school, I went down to Washington and worked for the SEC, sorry, Securities and Exchange Commission. I had a wonderful boss, uh, Jerome Frank, <coughs> uh, well known as a legal uh, realist and a, a very imaginative, uh, warm person. And then after a couple of years doing that, I went back to Chicago, my home then, practiced law for a short time. The uh, National Defense Commission was established, and I was asked to come back by uh, one of the uh, SEC commissioners who had become a National Defense Commissioner. That was Leon Henderson. And uh, I went back, and after reorganizations, I found myself working for Dean Atchison at the State Department, and I was there on uh, <coughs> Pearl Harbor Day, and uh, I didn't have a partner to, uh, in, to tell me about it, uh, and I didn't learn about it until 4 o'clock that oh. afternoon when I went to a, a party uh, Office of Production Management, and they said, oh, here comes the State Department. He'll let us know. And I said, let <laughs> you know what? And I said, <clears throat> left immediately, and I remember my greeting uh, from Dean Atchison. Atchison, it was, where the hell have you been? <laughs> <laughs> and we went to work, getting out the spatches and so on. And uh, <clears throat> as for... Uh, <laughs> Where I was, uh, oh, oh, well, the, since uh, <coughs> Whitney has told you about uh, his uh, getting into the Navy, perhaps I should tell you how I did that. How I did that. The day after Her Pearl Harbor, I turned up at a recruiting station, <laughs> and I found I was uh, <coughs> practically blind, and they had recruited a psychiatrist to help with the examinations, and when I finished, he said, young man, do you know where I'd like you to be in this war? And I said, no, sir. He said, I'd like you to be a gunner in a Japanese 
<laughs> and so <coughs> time passed and uh, they, they wouldn't take me as an apprentice seaman so uh, an OSS chap said well I'll get you a waiver so I became an ensign <coughs> went off to indoctrination school and uh, right before I was invited to be in uh, to go to Nuremberg, I was in San Francisco. And they got a, how did I get to Nuremberg? Well, it was the old boys network. Uh, Frank Shea, who had been uh, Jackson's attorney, assistant attorney general, when uh, <coughs> Mr. Jackson had been attorney general, uh, called me up and said, did I want to go to Nuremberg? I had met him casually and he knew a lot of people that I knew in Washington. And I, I thought about Nuremberg, and I didn't know very much about it, but uh, <coughs> it seemed that uh, General MacArthur was not very anxious to have more naval intelligence tap chaps in his theater, so that was scratched. So I said, sure, and that's how I got to Nuremberg. Okay. <laughs> Henry King, how about you? Let's well, situate you before Nuremberg. Absolutely. Uh, I uh, was 4F because I was rejected for military service uh, because of a heart murmur. And uh, I rocketed through the Yale Law School, did reasonably well, and landed up at the Milbank Tweed firm in New York. And uh, my wife was working on a uh, secret project at Columbia University, and uh, I was working hard there at Milbank. And, uh, we arranged to have Wednesday night dinners at Shrafts on Fifth Avenue. And once uh, Wednesday night, I asked uh, my wife, well, what do you do all day? I can't tell you. Well, it later developed, she was working on the atomic bomb project. She said, by the way, what do you do all day? Well, I said, I read agreements, I modify them, and I change them. My God, she said, there's a world out there. We ought to be part of it. That made me restless at the Milbank firm. And uh, as a result, I decided instead of a small fish in a big pond, I was going to be a big fish in a little pond. I find a classmate of mine from Yale Law School out for dinner to crow about it. Frequently, the telling is more important than the doing. And uh, I anticipated some uh, non-taxable psychic income when I told my classmate, Ted Fensenmacher, that I was, uh, was uh, uh, going to be a big shot in a small puddle. After the dinner, uh, he said, well, Henry, he said, I don't want to upstage you, but I'm joining the U.S. prosecution staff at Nuremberg. Well, I didn't get to bed that night. I was on the steps of the Pentagon the following day, and it wasn't long thereafter, needled by my wife, that I was on a ship sailing to Nuremberg. So I attribute my going to Nuremberg to that connection from Yale Law School with Ted Fensenbach, who is not here today. Now let's, let's begin to understand the, the focus of our conversation, uh, Robert H. Jackson. Who, who was he in your awareness before you got to see him in action in Nuremberg? He obviously had a distinguished career rising through the Roosevelt administration to the Attorney General, and then was on the Supreme Court as of 1941, as each of you as a young lawyer. What was Jackson on your radar screen, Whitney? Well, Jackson was really not uh, known to me except uh, he was a member of the Supreme Court of the United States when I was admitted to practice before the Supreme Court. And I have the photograph in my uh, studio, of course, of the Supreme Court with Justice Jackson there. And that's, uh, that was uh, my uh, vivid memory of Justice Jackson. Uh, so you had an admission uh, ceremony with him on the bench. Correct. And uh, so that was a, a, a memory that I retained at that time. Otherwise, I, I really didn't know anything about it. I was a country boy. I didn't know anything about uh, these, these gentlemen from the big cities. They know all about that. Right. But well, I mean, from the east, uh, I'm from the west. Now, Bernie, you mentioned uh, Jackson's work on the exchange of bases for destroyers. Explain what that, that deal was. Well, <coughs> The problem was that the British could use, obviously, destroyers in August of 1940, which was a very dark period in the war, so far as the British 
and their sympathizers were concerned. The, diff the technical difficulty was that although we had some mothballed destroyers, uh, there was a prohibition against giving away uh, government property. So the legal problem was to create a basis for some sort of an exchange. And somebody, presumably uh, <coughs> Mr. Jackson, decided that we would exchange these destroyers, which were not in active use by the United States for bases in the Caribbean, which the British controlled. And he wrote an opinion that laid the basis for that exchange, and it was a great contribution to British resources during a very difficult period for the British. So I associated Jackson with that at the time. In addition, <coughs> I had some time to follow Supreme Court opinions, and I could see from the beginning that Jackson was the master craftsman, was really <coughs> a magnificent uh, writer of opinions and normally included with an opinion some <coughs> uh, statement that rang through the ages. So I, I had a not a deep sense of Mr. Ju Justice Gaff, uh, Jackson's gifts, but some understanding of the contribution he was, had already made. Henry King, what about your view of Robert Jackson before Nuremberg? Well, I recall the uh, attempt by uh, Roosevelt, the alleged attempt to uh, pack the Supreme Court so that he could control it, and uh, I didn't favor it. Uh, I took a dissenting view on the destroyer deal because I was isolationist at that time. Uh, I uh, since have recognized uh, the wisdom of transferring those destroyers. But that was my view. At the, back. <laughs> yeah, that was my view at the time, and uh, I think he was a very smart lawyer who accomplished Roosevelt's objectives within our legal framework. Mm -hmm. I saw him as a immensely intelligent person, uh, a person who uh, made the law play magic, uh, and so uh, I had great respect for him. Although I disagreed with him on issues. And that's as a matter of your own politics at the time? He, uh, he my, was a uh, my, uh, I looked on the Supreme Court as a sacred American institution uh, that uh, had been created by the founders in a certain way. I thought they had a lot of wisdom in the way uh, they went about it. And uh, I think the majority of the United States Senate agreed with my view. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move into the Nuremberg phase and the actual work on the prosecution of the Nazis. Uh, Bernie, did you? go to London or did you go directly to Nuremberg? Well, I went <coughs> directly to neither place. Okay. I went directly to the State Department and looked at, with a team, and looked at all of the dispatches from Europe from 1933 to the outbreak of the war in September of 39. And we were looking for evidence particularly of uh, Germany's aggressive intent and whatever other evidence we could pick up. We didn't get much in the way of useful evidence, we, but we got a wonderful example how different people looking at the same basic phenomenon uh, interpret uh, <coughs> reality so differently. And we got a political background uh, for the work at Nuremberg, and I think it was a job that had to be done, and having done that, I went off to London for a bit. I didn't have, I, I didn't have anything to do with the drafting of the uh, uh, charter and the agreement for the charter, and uh, uh, right after London, I was there maybe a couple of weeks. I went uh, to uh, Nuremberg via Frankfurt. Okay. Now, Whitney, you were there during the summer of 1945 yes. for the London phase. Tell, right. tell us about that, what that work was about, and, and did it involve early contact with Justice Jackson? Well, it involved contact with his members of his staff, but I didn't have any contact with Justice Jackson. 
but of course he was there to work out the charter for the uh, for the tribunal uh, and this involved the uh, meetings with the uh, representatives from Russia and France uh, and uh, and Great Britain uh, uh, one of the issues uh, that Bernie has uh, raised was uh, that uh, uh, the question of aggressive war it was uh, agreeable uh, to the other negotiating parties that uh, aggressive, uh, aggressive war be included as a crime, provided that uh, the, uh, the attack was made in violation of a treaty or an agreement or an assurance, something between the two nations. And as a matter of fact, uh, Germany had reached uh, a non-aggression pacts with practically every country that it attacked, not the United States. Justice Jackson was very insistent that uh, aggression uh, must be considered an international crime and charged as such in the charter whether or not it, uh, it violated a, an agreement between two nations. Uh, the fact of uh, one nation attacking with armed force uh, the integrity of another nation should be a crime. Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing. I just happened to pick out of my files by an accident uh, this this morning uh, a speech that Justice Jackson made uh, after the conclusion of the trial in Brussels and uh, he make, he raises this very point he said today the common sense of mankind is also the law of nations at least we have mobilized the forces of the law on the side of peace and against aggression now I think we're talking now about the real Justice Jackson. I think this is the primary issue that Justice Jackson uh, wanted to assert in this trial. He says, the strength of the law may not always be equal to preventing wars, but at least it will no longer sanctify them. But most of all, we men of the law will no longer be perpetuating an immoral doctrine that all wars are legal. Wars of aggression are now beyond denial illegal, and those who induce, incite, or wage them are criminal. The world has taken a long time to reach the point of making it as much a crime to incite a war as it is to incite a riot, as dangerous to attack the world's peace as it has long been to act against the king's peace. I guess one measure of the success is that doesn't sound very controversial to hear you say that today. It doesn't sound controversial today, but of course it was controversial at the time uh, that uh, we were negotiating, that they were negotiating the, 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 the giving of the destroyers to Great Britain. Well, uh, <coughs> the, the French were quite opposed. Exactly. Uh, <coughs> and they were concerned about the ex post facto aspect, that is to say, that we were making law after the fact. The Russians had a, a distinctive Russian view, aggressive war by the Nazis, right. and only by the Nazis That's should right. be condemned. So the Russians were saying, we are not establishing, we do not want to establish a precedent for the future. And that, of course, was one of the primary objectives of Jackson and indeed uh, as uh, Jackson emphasized and the tribunal emphasized, the supreme contribution of the trial was that <coughs> aggressive war, particularly under modern conditions, was the great crime and that it wasn't enough to regulate how wars should be conducted. It was necessary to stamp it out at the very beginning by condemning aggression. Of course, that doesn't define the difficult issue of what is aggression, nor does it take care of the problem of enforcement. Uh, and it is a situation in which, <coughs> without power, there can be no justice. Right. Well, the power is a nice connection here. How was Jackson able to win the arm wrestling among the nations during that summer of 1945 about whether this well, should be the vision of the crime or something more narrow, perhaps only the, the Russian view well, uh, well, for this case only. Well, one, we had all the defendants that were important. And two, 
uh, Jackson was a tough bargainer. He was willing to go it alone. And the French ultimately gave ground, and I don't think the Russians <coughs> wanted to stay home. So, well, uh, yeah, you're right about that. He, uh, and, so, and indeed, one of the uh, problems that arose among the staff was whether uh, Jackson's negotiating stance vis-a-vis -vis the Russians had been too strong. But it carried the day, and uh, I, I think that uh, Jackson had grasped, really, the basic truth about modern warfare. In one sense, he was saying, the greatest crime against humanity is aggressive war itself. And all the other crimes, uh, violations of the laws of war and uh, crimes against humanity and the rest flow from war itself. I wanted to add a comment on what Whitney said on the aggressive war count. Uh, there is a Rome statute for an international criminal court. And uh, three of us, led by uh, Whitney, uh, the former prosecutors, uh, have got that aggression included in the statute for an international criminal court. Not effective now, but can be effective in the future after aggression is de defined, <laughs> right. after a, and seven eighths of the treaty signatories approved. Right. But it's a uh, it's a memorial to Jackson that right. uh, that's included in the statute, the Roman statute, for an international criminal court. I once found a note of caution here. I think that Nuremberg drew grew out of very special times and circumstances. And I think very often there is a tendency to reason from Nuremberg without looking at differences in the circumstances of Nuremberg and the circumstances that confront us at any particular time. The critical difference that I think we have to keep in mind is this. In Nurem at Nuremberg, the war had been fought, and it was not necessary to make war to do justice. We had the defendants. We had armies in the field looking for <coughs> evidence. The German people were devastated in, in spirit. There was no problem of creating uh, martyrs who thought they would get a ticket to paradise if they engaged in mass murders. The people of occupied Europe insisted on a trial. There was no opposition throughout the world. So all of the circumstances were right for that enterprise. Uh, other times raised different problems. And I'm not suggesting how those problems should be resolved now. But I think it's very important to keep in mind the special context of Nuremberg. One of the, uh, uh, when this issue arose during the negotiations at London, uh, General Nikolchenko, who was a representative of the Soviets in uh, bargaining, uh, was very sensitive. Uh, as Ber Bernie points out, the circumstances, uh, you know, tend to control uh, our viewpoint. Uh, Nikochenko was, General Nikochenko was concerned about the Soviet aggressions against Finland and so forth. They, I mean, the Soviets, the, well, sure, the, and, and against Poland itself. So, uh, you know, uh, they were very hesitant indeed to agree mm -hmm. that uh, aggression generally should mm -hmm. be uh, considered a crime. They said, uh, yeah, we'll deal with aggression when committed by the, uh, the, the, the Axis powers. That, that's fine, the European <laughs> Axis. Uh, and he held to that position. Throughout the end, Justice Jackson said, uh, we can't agree to anything like that. If that's the case, well, then we'll just go ahead and try the case ourselves. I don't, we, we, but the thing is, you see, we had all the defendants. Right. And poor, the power <laughs> poor Russia. Yeah. They had two. <laughs> that's all. They had, uh, they had uh, Grand, uh, Grand Admiral Raider yeah. and... Uh, and, uh, yeah. and he was not... Uh, Dermot. Uh, was it Dermot? No, 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 no. Uh, Fritchie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. 
So they had those two, and you know, <laughs> he couldn't have much of a trial with that, so they went along. Uh, but uh, of course, Jackson absolutely insisted on this issue. This was the big issue. And, 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 and this is the issue which is going to live in history, I think. Uh, Bernie is right. Uh, circumstances uh, affect uh, conditions. But we must accept the view that waging aggressive war is a crime. And I don't think there's any yeah. doubt that, uh, that, that, that uh, the world now agrees mm -hmm. to that. I think the important thing is that in the decisions, uh, there was no generic definition of aggression in the judgment of the tribunal. Um, and uh, although the well, Russians... We didn't have to. It was no, so obvious. It right. was so but clear. That's your but, point. But there's, no, no there's not generic language oh, on right. a uh, definition well, of aggression. They mean? found what the Russians did was oh. aggression. I, I'd like to make one more I point. mean, what the uh, Nazis, Nazis did. Nazis did. It was Sorry. very aggressive. Sorry. 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 I want to make uh, one, one, more, one more point about the Russians, it, because it, it underscores that usually in these circumstances, we don't have perfect options. Here, the great contribution of Nuremberg was to <coughs> outlaw aggressive war and to hold the major architects and executives personally accountable. And who was sitting on the tribunal? The Russians. The Russians, mm -hmm. who themselves had been guilty of aggression against Poland and Finland and the Baltic states. Nonetheless, in the hopes, I think, of post-war collaboration, um, <coughs> we accepted that arrangement uh, and recognized that uh, life is hard. You must make difficult choices. Well, the problem was that they had played a major role in oh, the course. victory. Right, they oh, paid course. a terrible price. Right. They pay, yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Let's, yeah. let's talk about the trial work itself. You were members of a, of a large staff. Jackson's at the pyramid of, mm -hmm. of a sizable organization. How was it set up? What pieces and roles did each of you play? And, and how did the work generally flow from and to Jackson in your experiences? With well, uh, of course, uh, Jackson had, uh, at the outset, uh, uh, Robert Story as executive trial counsel. And uh, the various aspects of the case were assigned by uh, story, I presume, in consultation with Jackson, I don't know, uh, to, uh, to develop. Uh, we had decided uh, pretty much at the outset that this was going to be a documentary case, that that was the final decision that Justice Jackson made. So therefore, uh, various uh, teams were set up of lawyers. Well, as it happened in my own case, uh, uh, since I had been identified as uh, from OSS, and OSS, com uh, uh, under the German system, combined the repressive agencies with the intelligence agencies. Uh, Bob Story said to me, well, uh, you go ahead and do what you can, prepare a brief on, uh, on the uh, Gestapo and the SD. These were the two uh, primary state uh, repressive agencies and their chief, Ernst Kaltenberg, that was one of the defendants. And uh, they gave me, uh, signed me uh, an office in the drafty Palace of Justice, a German secretary, a second-hand typewriter, and he said, just go ahead and uh, prepare a brief and get the proofs to assemble to, uh, uh, to take care of this. This is the one-man operation. Uh, and so, uh, so I proceeded. Now, in other cases, uh, there were teams of lawyers where there's a the big uh, problem with the economic case or something like that where they needed to get lots of information. And uh, so I had a very, uh, very pleasant and, uh, and delightful time in, uh, in, uh, in uh, preparing this evidence. And I succeeded in doing so, so that uh, I was the first one to present a, a case uh, in court, or the right. case against Ernst Kaufman. Right. Now that, that work, you work in the documents, you write a brief, you assemble the proof. Right. How does it move its way up to a supervisor? How does it become known to Jackson? How, how does it become part of the courtroom proceeding? Well, uh, we wrote the briefs, at least in my case, I guess you did too, we wrote yeah, the briefs right. and they were all uh, reproduced and uh, the tribunal, uh, then the briefs were of course submitted for review by the exec uh, by, uh, executive trial counsel, in this case uh, Bob Story, and I don't know others in other cases, and for all I know, uh, Justice Jackson, I, I really don't know. And uh, in, in my case, uh, the uh, brief 
uh, and the evidence uh, was accepted, and the tribunal re uh, demanded that the entire uh, that uh, we uh, read from the document, any document that we were going to introduce in evidence, had to be read in in completion. That portion which upon which we relied, we couldn't just simply introduce a document which made it rather tedious and difficult for us. But uh, 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 that uh, uh, when it, uh, the time came for the uh, uh, for the, uh, the court appearance, and I was asked to do that, and I presented the case. That's all. Right. Now, Bernie, you were working in a different part of the of the project. I was working initially on the economics case. Uh, <coughs> I reported to Frank Shea, who reported to Jack. And what was the economics case? What's, what's well, that part? Well, <coughs> uh, uh, the economics case uh, covered the financing of the war, slave labor, uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the spoiling of the continent, pillaging, plunder, per throughout, first throughout the whole continent. Well, now, uh, well before the trial started, Frank Shea left. And there had been some falling out, unhappily, between uh, uh, Shea and the justice. And Frank Shea left without a word. And there was no word from anybody else. Uh, and, and so I was coordinating a group dealing with the economic case, <laughs> and we just went about our business. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> somebody said, well, you will present the case against Funk, or, or maybe they said, will you present the case against Funk? Uh, and initially, against Shock. And I said, yes, sir. And I made an independent study of the shock evidence, and I concluded he would be acquitted. And I was getting <laughs> mail from the states, from the lefty press, saying, shock is going to be acquitted because he's a banker and he knows all the other bankers, and the bankers will look after their own. <laughs> well, I was, I guess I was then the youngest person on the prosecution staff that had a speaking part. So I thought it was, I, I should report to my uh, <coughs> bosses that they could be criticized for sending a boy to do a man's job if Shock was acquitted, as I thought he would be. I made <laughs> it quite clear I was, it was quite sensible yeah. for me to deal with Shock and Funk, because Funk had succeeded Shock. Well, there was a silence. I was relieved of the shock case. <laughs> and then, to my astonishment, Brady Bryson, who was either two, year, two weeks younger or two weeks older than I, I forget which, he was <coughs> asked to do the shock case. He did a brilliant job, but shock was acquitted. <laughs> now, the other thing that came to me had nothing to do with the economic case. I was still working on uh, the Funk case when I guess Tom Dodd was then executive. Uh, trial counsel. What was he? Trial counsel. Trial counsel. Counsel. But he was yeah. first right. lieutenant. He was a deputy. Deputy. Of the so he said, "Would well, I? There, there's a mess in the concentration camp case. There were ten days to go." You needed three days for production. Would I sort of finish it? Mm -hmm. I said, if I get two German-speaking lawyers whom I identified, uh, I'd be glad to do it. And they came on board. They dug into the evidence. They, uh, <coughs> and uh, they scrounged for evidence. I wrote as fast as I could. And we got it done in seven days. But one, one of the extraordinary uh, reactions we had was, here is the concentration camp case, the emblem of the Nazi regime. Right. And the supervision of that case was so loose that nobody until 
10 days before knew that rescue efforts were necessary. Right. But there was such, uh, what should I say, richness is not a word except to a lawyer. There was such a mass of evidence. There was a lot of evidence. evidence. Right. Oh. Right. And the, mm -hmm. the German tendency to keep records right. really made all the difference right. in the world. Right. Now, Henry, you arrived later. The trial was right. underway. Yeah. Where were you plugged in to the trial? I was plugged into work? the German general staff and high command case. They were tried as a group at, at Nuremberg, and I worked under Telford Taylor, and I worked on the case itself. I worked on the brief against the general staff, also on uh, Jackson's closing statement regarding the German general staff. Uh, also, I was assigned three defendants. Uh, who are members of the German general staff. One was Walter von Brauchitsch, who was commander-in-chief of the German army. Another was Heinz Guderian, who was chief of staff of the high command of the German army. And the other was Erhard Milch, who was... Now, the they, they weren't defendants in the initial international no. trial. Well, they were part of the group. They were uh, part of the high command. They were not command. isolated as defendants right. in the first case. Okay. But they were part of the group, which were included in the general staff case. Later in the decision, the general staff was not found to be a cohesive uh, group, and so we pursued cases against them individually. In the later uh, trial. Later That's trial. right, yeah, right. and I prepared okay. the case against Brockage, and he was turned over to the British. Case against Guderian, uh, Guderian was about to be turned over to the Poles, and we got in a fight with the Poles over the Oder Nissa line, and the boundaries there, and uh, Guderian got as far as Berlin, and then came back and was freed and uh, went to North Germany, where my recollection is he engaged in some neo-Nazi activities. But Erhard Milch was uh, the case I was uh, the driving force on, and uh, we uh, ended, tried it at uh, Nuremberg, and uh, I was assigned the underground aircraft factories phase of the case and tried in part that. At the same time, Milch uh, was given a life sentence for slave labor. Uh, he appealed to the Supreme Court, and the uh, Supreme Court, on a 4-4 decision, refused to take jurisdiction. Uh, the, well, the, the Supreme Court of the United States. Supreme United States. Court of the United States. With, yeah, with right. Robert Jackson not uh, participating. Not participating, right. yeah. Right. So, uh, that made I was... The stone if you were around happy. Yeah. Right. Uh, he was gone, but I'm sure <laughs> his ghost was happy. Yeah. Right. I also no. played a miscellaneous role on, uh, as a uh, utility fielder on cases like the ministry's case and uh, the, the case against the lawyers. Right. Well, one of the outset, uh, the, uh, the, the concept was that, uh, uh, that uh, individuals would be brought to trial. Mm -hmm. uh, there were 24 originally indicted, of course. Uh, but uh, then uh, the view was that uh, we must reach farther than this. This is the major trial, and therefore we'll indict organizations and have them declared criminal by the tribunal. Then in a subsequent proceeding, where individuals are brought to trial before perhaps a German uh, tribunal, uh, that fact will be already established, that the organization to which they, uh, of which they were members was a criminal organization. Now, the tribunal was very concerned about this and what the consequence might be, so the tribunal very rightly uh, conditioned uh, this, uh, this ruling uh, upon a finding that the uh, person joined voluntarily with knowledge mm -hmm. of the criminal objectives of the organization. Nevertheless, this was utilized uh, in subsequent trials by uh, uh, German tribunals under control call, uh, law, con uh, 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 control law council, uh, council ten, uh, and uh, uh, individuals who came before the German tribunals then and were members of the SS, say, uh, uh, if established that they did join with knowledge of the criminal purpose of that organization, were then punished by the German tribunal. But the concept, I, I think the concept of holding associations criminal and making right. membership without regard to knowledge right. criminal was really uh, not a good idea. Well, no, and no, it no, created... No, no, everybody. It, it, crea it created great problems in the courtroom because right. 
because the lawyers were really challenged by the tribunal on that, yeah, and what, the tribunal fixed up the charge. Yeah, right. Judge Park was very strong on that. Well, one point. Uh, and he was right. Is, uh, he was the right. general staff was tried as a group. They were not convicted, no. and then the individuals yes. right. were tried. Well, there were right. only four organizations that were, that were convicted. The, the, the leadership uh, role of the, of the right. party. The Gestapo. Uh, the Gestapo, the SD, and the SS. Mm -hmm. I had two of them. Now, I, had the, I had the Gestapo. Let's turn to direct tasks for Jackson. Were there things that were specific requests or assignments for him that fell to any of you? Bernie? No. 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 <clears throat> the, uh, there was a problem of volunteering. Uh, because I was interested in Funk and Shock, I um, interrogated Goering pre-trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, picked up some items that might have been helpful to anybody getting ready to cross-examine him. Or to make the opening statement. Or, or, well, this was after the, well after the opening statement. Okay. Uh, uh, of course, I, Gehring and Schock were not exactly friends. Right, <laughs> right exactly. <laughs> and the argument, indeed, indeed it was said that Schock resigned, not out of principle, but because he lost the power struggle okay. with Goering. Right. Uh, in any event, uh, that, that is why I was interested in Mr. Goering. Uh, and what I had was not of central importance, and it wasn't that uh, the military tradition, don't volunteer, <laughs> <laughs> was dominant. But I decided, oh no, um, the justice has a lot on his plate. Right. If anybody wants uh, what we have, uh, we will be asked. Right. But uh, so far as I was concerned, none of my work uh, in the way of assignments came directly from uh, the justice. And I got no supervision from him. And in fact, uh, so far as my brief, in support of the prosecution case for Funk was concerned. No one looked at it besides me. Mm -hmm. And so far as the con concentration camp uh, uh, case, uh, there was not a single word changed. So I'm quite sure that Mr. Justice Jackson did not see those papers. Right, right. No. That case ultimately was not presented by Jackson. No, that was by Chris Dodd. That was by uh, Tom Dodd. Tom Dodd, sorry. Right. Now, Whitney, I think you had a, an experience that was a little bit different. What kinds of things uh, did Jackson need that, that fell to you? What kinds of project contact did you have with Jackson? Well, uh, aside from uh, <coughs> my basic uh, case, of course, which is against Colin Brunner and the Gestapo uh, and the SD, uh, uh, as far as I know, I had no direct contact with Justice Jackson at all in the preparation of my briefs or even the presentation in court or the, or the, uh, the, the uh, cross-examination of witnesses. I cross-examined a few witnesses. Uh, as far as I know, now, uh, I did have a very significant role, however, with Justice Jackson, which was in the cross-examination of Furman Gehring. Right. Tell us about and, that. Uh, well, that was, a, that was a cl uh, really a climactic uh, uh, time of the trial, uh, normally Justice Jackson would have uh, with him at the desk beside the podium Elsie uh, uh, Douglas, uh, his secretary, or, 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 or Bill Jackson, his son, who would, who would help by handling the documents that he might need uh, in the discussion presentation. Uh, the cross-examination, in the case of the cross-examination of Herman Gehring, he asked me to help him. Uh, this was a very critical uh, time in the trial. It was a very important trial. The trial, everything had been rather dull for some time. The press was all uh, 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 alert to the excitement of the chief uh, prosecutor for the United States uh, cross-examining the, the leader that really the chief leader of the Nazi regime, right. now living. Right. Symbolically, he Symbolically, was the biggest symbolic. defendant. And he was on And the fattest. He was on repentance. Right. You see. And all this business about the laws of war, obsolete. So he attacked the fundamental basis for the trial. So, well, let me explain what actually happened, since it was my responsibility. 
uh, now, I want to say at the outset that Justice Jackson uh, did uh, himself develop the line of, uh, uh, of examination, cross-examination of Herman Gary. Uh, that wasn't my function. That was Justice Jackson's function. His concept was, we can prove to this witness, because he is so arrogant anyway, that uh, uh, the whole concept of the, of the Nazi conspiracy, the seizure of power, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, preparation for the assault on other nations, uh, the uh, following through with the, uh, with the uh, destruction of, uh, of uh, populations, uh, the extermination of peoples and so forth, we can prove this through this witness. Now remember that when uh, Jackson persuaded the British to a trial, rather than to uh, eliminate these people through executive action, the British con concern was we shouldn't afford these uh, uh, individuals an opportunity to espouse Nazism from the, from the courtroom. Uh, you give these fellows a trial, they'll get on the, uh, on the stand and they'll talk all about Nazism and get the German people all uh, upset and, uh, again. Uh, better to get rid of them with executive action. That was the British contention. That was the concern of the British. This was the concern of all of us at the outset. At that point, Jackson was, uh, the, uh, you see, uh, uh, Garing was the first defense witness. This was going to be a dr truly dramatic thing. And Garing was an arrogant person. We all knew that. Jackson sought to prove the entire conspiracy through this witness. He uh, started out by uh, saying that uh, the, uh, as soon as uh, you got into power, you uh, were determined to eliminate the Weimar uh, Constitution. You were determined to make a, a dictatorship, eliminate the right of people to vote, and so forth. That was his concept, to show how these Nazi conspirators uh, seized power of Germany, controlled the power of Germany, uh, supplanted the will of the people, and then engaged in, in, in aggression, and in connection with aggression with his terrible crimes against humanity. The, the concept was perfect. So we started out and Goering was very good. But Goering soon got the idea that, well, he could expand a little bit on his, on his responses. And he would say, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what you do in the United States, you do the same thing. Or words to this effect. And every question that, that Jackson would put to Gary, and Gary would come up with some smart answer. Uh, Gary, so Jackson was extremely concerned about this, and he then uh, made his uh, uh, challenge to the tribunal and asked Lord Lawrence to uh, control, the, 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 uh, instruct Gary to, 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 to control himself and not to make these uh, uh, expansive uh, answers, uh, which were not really relevant for the most part. But Judge uh, Lawrence was, uh, you know, apprehensive, again, of the fairness of this trial. This was so important. We must not show any indication that this is a, uh, a tribunal set out to convict. And so Lord Lawrence gave Gary much more leeway than a judge would give a witness in a court in the United States of America. And this got Justice Jackson very upset, and that is what led to the altercation of, that happened two or three times in the uh, Jackson the complaint to the tribunal. However, all this disappeared uh, after we got by this, when we got into the uh, the, the sordid uh, role of Gehrig in the mistreatment of the Jews and. Uh, mistreatment of uh, captured allied airmen and so forth and toward the end of the examination when the press really was not too much interested anymore uh, Gehring has hung his head and answered the questions and didn't attempt to make any long-winded explanation of anything. The, the early questions were more open-ended. Mm -hmm. yes, the answers more. were open-ended. Well, I, and, I, I, I and, warned and that, that. And, and uh, the strategy <coughs> Involve that risk, right. uh, but Jackson. You laid, were there watching. Oh, I sure was. Okay. I was watching, 
<coughs> it was not the happiest day of the trial. Right. No, but uh, uh, Jackson, having laid that general basis, created a groundwork for the British prosecution, prosecutor to ask very tight questions. Yeah, that's right. And the combination of the two cross-examinations, mm -hmm. which I think is a fair way to look at it, Re really did a job. In the end, well, we, in the end. In the end, we destroyed the end. Goering. You're quite right, Sir, Sir David Sir Maxwell Fife. Sir didn't. David Maxwell Fife. But he was, uh, he was alert from the outset, that the, the danger of this approach. Yes, it was a sure. dangerous approach. Was, Whitney, you started to say yeah. you had warned Justice Jackson. Did what? You had warned Justice no, no, Jackson? No, 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 I had not warned Justice Jackson. Uh, no, 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 no. I, okay. I, I went right along with the concept, but I, I was a little concerned about it, but I, you know. No, says it. Oh, I, who am I to do that? No, I wouldn't do that. But I, uh, I don't know if this is a fair question, but I will ask it. And that is whether, because Justice Jackson had been a Supreme Court justice and had been accustomed to great deference, whether the arrogance of Goering got to him. Well, uh, yes, I think that's absolutely right, and uh, and Gehring was arrogant, oh, and, yeah. and and his responses were uh, his answers were not responsive mm -hmm. in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he did go beyond, I oh. think, the realm of proper response to uh, uh, questions, even on cross examination. Uh, Jackson's position was, uh, you know, he said, "Well, uh, you can uh, on redirect." Uh, no. You can say anything you want. Go ahead on it, read the rep. But, but I want to proceed here and answer the question, and uh, we don't have to have a, a long-winded response. Yeah. Yeah. But, but Lord Lawrence, uh, you know, with yeah. that British tradition of absolute fairness and all, and, and thinking of history, yeah. and, and the concept that this trial must be established as the fairest possible trial, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, he leaned over backwards to let Gehring... Uh, and as a matter of fact, as I look back on this now, Gehring himself restrained himself to some extent in his answers after Jackson made his mm -hmm. appeal to Lord Lawrence, even though the judge did not require him to. Restrain. Even Gehring realized that he was, you know, answering questions uh, with, with remarks which were really not relevant. And as I say, toward the end, he, he just answered the question, yes or no. And, and for the most part, Gehring was honest. Uh, when, we, uh, when we interrogated him on, uh, on uh, issues uh, relative to the treatment of Jews or the, uh, or the uh, crystal knot, uh, where it was a uh, disgusting uh, behavior on Gehring's part, uh, he said, I would not, uh, I'd just like to say, I would not want to be a Jew in Germany today, and things like that, you know. Uh, he didn't, uh, well, he the, gave up. Uh, didn't uh, uh, Lord Lawrence's approach add credibility to the trial, the fairness of yes, the Yes, I think it, I think, I think ultimately it, was, it did. Well, I think sure. his approach was... A but it lost this, uh, uh, the press, the sure. press, you know, uh, didn't understand what yeah, was right, done. Right. They treated it as an isolated... Right, but we can look back on it, and uh, it certainly has importance from a historical standpoint. But from right. If you shut him off and uh, allowed him, didn't allow him his speech, then uh, you could have be accused of unfairness. Well, it's better oh, than... Oh, exactly. Yeah, right. we gave him enough rope to hang yeah. himself. Henry, you mentioned earlier that you were able to draft some material for Jackson's use in his closing statement. Tell us about that piece of work for the boss. Yeah, I thought this was my moment in the sun. Uh, I thought I was a good writer, uh, and it re related to General Staff and High Command. Uh, and I worked uh, all night on the thing. Uh, I thought I was a good wordsmith, and. Uh, I look to my knowledge, my language, to be part of history. But uh, when the uh, the closing statement came out, uh, I didn't find a word that was mine. And uh, I later found out that Jackson didn't like ghosts as such. I think he condemned them, didn't he, Bernie, in a Supreme Court decision. Uh, I I was disappointed, but I took years to find out why I didn't 
appear in that closing statement through these words. And uh, these words were not immortalized, but the words were his. Uh, but my understanding of Jackson in later years grew, and I thoroughly understood it. Right. He was a man who did his own work. Absolutely. Um, happy yeah. to receive good input, but did his own writing. Right. And uh, the words were immortal, the words he used. Mm. Uh, uh, they they uh, they spoke worlds in short sentences, and uh, the Jackson words will live forever. I think that's right. A thousand years from now, uh, we'll be remembering pieces of that opening statement. Let nobody, me ask, we've never had anybody quite like him. Let me ask about other observations and opportunities you had during this year at Nuremberg uh, to see Jackson, um, his courtroom work, his office work. Um, perhaps off the job or social settings. What other memories do you have of Robert Jackson, Whitney? Well, uh, uh, of course, uh, his courtroom work was uh, just impeccable. He was, uh, he always uh, wore his morning coat and uh, he, uh, he conducted himself uh, in an ex exemplary fashion. He uh, was very intelligent in his uh, examination of uh, witnesses. His questions were extremely good. Uh, he was uh, uh, perhaps not as aggressive as some might be, but uh, his, uh, his, uh, his greatest contribution in this respect was uh, his speeches that he made, his opening address, his closing address, uh, he's a, a writer, a, un, a legal writer without parallel in the 20th century as far as I'm concerned. He was absolutely uh, 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 persuasive and his language, choice of uh, language was uh, exemplary and beautiful and effective and he was a strong speaker. Uh, he just uh, has to uh, be a giant among uh, lawyers. I think those speeches ought to be must reading for students of uh, American history. I think that uh, the words are very persuasive, as uh, Whitney says. I think uh, he, he was able to put in concise form uh, men's ideas mm -hmm. and carry them through. It was not only the ideas, though. It was also the way he summarized the event of an epoch uh, covering continents <coughs> and the, the <coughs> sequence, the organization uh, just added to the power of his language. I mean, th the clarity of his understanding was reflected in the flow of the language and the interrelationship of uh, one paragraph to the next so that whatever <coughs> uh, differences one might have about Jackson's cross-examination or any other facet of his trial work. The contribution of those statements make uh, any uh, <coughs> imperfections seem, as the lawyers say, de minimis. They are just overshadowed by this right. enormous contribution uh, to the trial and to the understanding of the enterprise and the understanding of the Nazi regime. Right. What about outside of the courtroom? What was he like in <coughs> the other settings that were part of the Nuremberg experience? Well, I remember two settings. <coughs> For reasons unknown to me, uh, I was invited by the justice uh, to be part of a group that he was hosting at Garmish. And uh, I remember Jim Rowe. Garmisch is in the Alps. In the Alps, right close to uh, Hitler's, what was this, his Eagle's Nest? Eagle's well, Nest. You're, talking about, uh, you're not talking about uh, Garmisch, you're talking about Berkus Garden. Berkus Garden, I'm sorry, you're we right. We were there at the time. We were there. Uh, well, anyhow, I remember person. going to Berkus Garden and having that magnificent view and wondering what more could Hitler want? What kind of maniac was there here? And then <clears throat> I went down to the R and R retreat, where recreation, rest and recreation, where there was lunch, and I had a somewhat embarrassing experience. I played a couple of sets of ping pong, and I think I had a uh, 
highball and sat down to lunch. My luncheon companion was the wife of the French judge. Uh, there was not, what should I say, strictness about separation of power there. And uh, in the middle of lunch, I excused myself. And when I woke up, I was prone. And somebody was working on me. And he said, <laughs> not to worry. 20% of the people who come there and don't wait to adjust to the altitude <coughs> pass out. But I said to him, I'm afraid Mr. Justice Jackson will think it was the alcohol, not the <laughs> altitude. altitude. So he served as my lawyer, and the justice was very understanding. <laughs> and I remember another larger group when Mrs. Biddle came over. And the Biddles had an international party. And uh, Mrs. Biddle decided to teach the Russians the Virginia reel. And I saw how <laughs> amused uh, the justice was at the, that exercise. But I didn't have, quite unlike Dean Acheson or Jerome Frank, I didn't have many face-to-face uh, -face meetings or, or any sense of uh, uh, personal friendship with the just. He right. was a commanding figure, uh, dignified, powerful, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and enormously able, but not somebody I worked with day by day. Right. Well, these moments do start to give us a glimpse of the personality. Whitney, how would you describe Jackson in terms of temperament and attitude and style, you know, a, a, as a man, as a person? Oh, uh, Justice Jackson was a, uh, a man of uh, very strong and positive convictions. If he believed uh, in an issue, he would stand for that issue through, through everything. Uh, this is demonstrated by the negotiations in London, for example. Justice Jackson would not give one inch uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, the other uh, participants in the trial if, if uh, in respect to the manner in which this trial was to be conducted. It had to be uh, a trial which would be acceptable in the, uh, in the eyes of, uh, of uh, lawyers in the United States and, and in our own uh, system of, of justice. Uh, he was he was so determined that he would have given up the trial, absolutely, and therefore he persuaded them to on all American points he prevailed. So he was a man of great determination. Uh, he was a man of kindness to people like us who were low down in the in the uh, in the prosecution staff, you might say. Uh, he was a friend. He was kind. He, uh, uh, of course, uh, sometimes he asked us for help, uh, and we were able to give it to him. Uh, but uh, 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 he always was considerate of the person down low in the throne pole. He wasn't afraid of challenging those that were higher up, as, for example, in the case of, uh, of uh, General Donovan. I mean, General Donovan had a very good point that uh, we should uh, start out this trial with uh, some of the uh, leading German uh, uh, leaders of uh, Nazi Germany and really expose the, the type of people they are through cross-examination, Justice Jackson. Uh, thinking about the, uh, the, uh, the status of the trial in history, rejected this report. It didn't matter that General Donovan was was a very powerful man and had been selected by him as his number two man. General Donovan went home. So uh, he was uh, a man of his own convictions. Mm -hmm. uh, now, he did uh, have a tendency, I think, perhaps to, uh, you know, be, uh, could be irritated. Mm -hmm. uh, as in the, we talked about the cross-examination of Gary, he was irritated. He did lose his temper, you might say, to some degree. Um, uh, if that's a fault, that's, that's certainly a, the minus, the, 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 the least fault that any great man could have. I think right. he had the courage of his convictions in the face of the uh, slings and arrows of his countrymen. Uh, after all, uh, Chief Justice Stone disparaged the Nuremberg trial as a high-class lynching expedition. Uh, took a lot of criticism from uh, 
passed particularly in a Kenyan college speech in 1946. Uh, and, uh, but Jackson stuck with it. That's the important thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thought he was right, and he had strength to uh, see Nuremberg through and never to lose the, uh, the vision that he had of a better world through Nuremberg. With, re with respect to convictions, there's a kind of parallelism between Taft and uh, <coughs> Jackson. Yeah. Uh, Taft got a lot of criticism for his criticism of the Jackson. trial right. and of Jackson, and then uh, Taft made it in uh, <coughs> oh, uh, Kennedy's uh, Profiles, Profiles and, Courage. and Courage. That's right. And of course, it used to be said of uh, Senator Taft, he had the best mind in Washington until he made it up. <laughs> He's stuck with it. Now, let, let's, let's talk to the bottom line. You've described this, the skills and temperament and ability of, of this extraordinary lawyer. Um, and from each of your perspectives as a participant, Nuremberg was about something truly important. For the general public and today in 2001, um, what did Nuremberg accomplish? Whitney, how do you see that? Well, I think uh, 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 Nuremberg has uh, set a completely new uh, uh, standard of international law with respect to the responsibilities of the leaders of, of uh, uh, nations. Uh, uh, no longer can any person who is uh, responsible for the affairs of a nation who engages leads that nation to aggressive war, for example, say, well, after all, this is the act of, uh, of the country and not, not my responsibility. Uh, Nuremberg, uh, and this is uh, without a doubt Justice Jackson's uh, greatest contribution is that leaders of nations who, engage, who lead their country in, into uh, wars of aggression have got to answer personally for the crimes committed in that, in that uh, engagement. Uh, this is uh, this is Jackson's greatest contribution, I think, to international law. Uh, he uh, he also, I think, uh, has set a standard that uh, no individual shall be uh, uh, punished for a crime, alleged crime, in international law, unless he has an opportunity to defend himself, a fair chance, a judicial proceeding. He has brought the concept of the common law into international law, really. Uh, and uh, we now live, uh, if we follow uh, Jackson's uh, uh, precedent, his thinking, we live in a world in which uh, leaders of states that engage in aggressive war are personally accountable for the crimes committed in the course of that aggression. And, and uh, this is, uh, this is his, uh, I think, his, uh, his greatest achievement. Okay. Bernie, how would you uh, answer? <coughs> I would uh, agree completely with uh, uh, Whitney's uh, <coughs> giving paramount importance to aggressive war mm -hmm. uh, and personal accountability. In addition, I think this theme has been sounded before, but it, it bears repetition. I think creating this history of the Nazi regime <coughs> was a justification for the damage that we inflicted on the German people, and was also a reminder to them <coughs> of the consequences of their silence about the regime that uh, <coughs> was responsible for the war and the atrocities that preceded and uh, surrounded it. I think that uh, <coughs> uh, in addition, the facts about crimes against humanity as distinguished from the concept as right. dealt with in the tribunal's judgment, the facts about crimes against humanity really stimulated the whole growth of humanitarian law. We, we have there, of course, 
great aspirations. We have problems of enforcement, but nonetheless, uh, the <coughs> aspirations in many quarters will affect uh, conduct, and in others, if, we've, if conduct is not, not effective and we have power to capture <coughs> those guilty, we will have a, president, a precedent for uh, dealing uh, with them in a way that's just and uh, fair and gives them an opportunity to defend themselves. And I, I think that uh, Jackson introduced this, uh, the concept that international law applied to individuals, that individuals had rights and duties that were international in scope. Uh, Milosevic is on the dock at uh, The Hague today because of uh, the introduction of responsibility of higher-ups. So Jackson symbolizes uh, human accountability for uh, mistakes and uh, for crimes. Also, I could say w with some conviction that Internet uh, Nuremberg marked the start of the International Human Rights Movement. It was the first implementation in the court of international human rights. Also, in the judgment in the uh, statute that uh, Jackson, the Charter, London Charter of August 8, 1945, the uh, fact that uh, the Nazi laws approved of what was done to the Jewish people was not held to be an excuse. That's mm -hmm. in the statute, our, our uh, Charter of London, that uh, you can't hide behind national laws. So I think Jackson was in, in, in important in limiting sovereignty as a, uh, a means of hiding behind uh, hiding behind uh, the nation state for crimes that had been committed. So it's a whole new era of international law. He's had immense uh, influence on our world today. We're not finished with it, but uh, I think the International Criminal Law Court, which is uh, uh, designed by the Rome Statute of 1998 is a step forward on uh, institutionalizing what Jackson's concepts were on a permanent basis, not just an ad hoc basis. Well, gentlemen, that's a wonderful catalog of the achievements of Robert Jackson and the work at Nuremberg. I, I would close by reading just a short excerpt from an interview he gave to a historian uh, in 1953, the year before he became ill and then passed away. Jackson said, as to my personal feelings about the trials, I regard it without qualification as the most satisfying and gratifying experience of my life. The success in carrying it through being the only joint effort between Americans and Soviet that has succeeded since the war, I look upon with a good deal of satisfaction. Notwithstanding the imperfections of the agreement in London, I think it represents a very important contribution to international law and the trials represent an important contribution to legal history. Despite all the wear and tear and personal inconvenience of the trials, I'm sure that given a similar opportunity, I would do it again. What is, uh, is, is that, that a view that's that you share? <laughs> well, if Bernie and Henry were there, I'd go to it. <laughs> Gentlemen, on behalf of the Robert Jackson Center, yeah, okay. thank you to each of you for participating. All right. Well, it was fun to be here. It's a delight. On behalf of the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York, I'd like to thank the participants in this discussion, Mr. Whitney Harris, Professor Bernard Meltzer, and Professor Henry King. These are men who were on the staff and worked with Justice Robert Jackson in the prosecution of the lead Nazi war criminals, Nuremberg, Germany, 1945-1946. Thank you very much for sharing your memories of that time, that work, and that man. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank